everyone. Welcome back to my channel. I am your Hello Queen, and this episode is going to talk about the first three episodes of The Wheel of Time. It's put on by Amazon Prime. It's coming out with new episodes every Friday. Unfortunately, I'm a little late to the game, so today the fourth episode is out, but I have not yet watched it, so we're not going to talk about that. Come on back with a drink, and I'm going to craft, and we're going to talk about it. Okay, so yes, I'm a little late to the game. I had some technical difficulties getting me into this. So for those of you who are actually interested in the craft, uh, this is a Diamond Art Club painting called Little Helpers. It's one of their Christmas paintings. It's new for this year. Um, let me just turn off the light pad for a second. It always looks better with the light pad off. Uh, it's diamond painting. It's what I'm working on right now. But we're talking about it with a little time. I guess I don't necessarily need the light pad on for a diamond art club. It is helpful though. So the first three episodes come out and they have made significant departures from the books. A lot of the departures are expediency. In a book you can meander and take your time and explain all the lore and explain all the reasons why you're doing this and everything else. In a more visual medium, every moment that you're meandering, you're having to pay cast and crew and all of those people for time is money on a film set. You can't you don't have the same luxuries you have in time and space that you do when you're writing a book. So, of course there's going to be changes. Of course there's going to be some things that are changed specifically just to keep things moving. Um, the first change that I noticed is they've aged up and changed the main characters. I'm going to attempt to uh, discuss this for people who have not read the books without discussing spoilers. There is a change that they have made that if I talk too much about it could constitute a spoiler. So I'm going to try to kind of dance around that a little bit. They've aged up the characters. So I'm going to try to avoid spoilers. Understand that I have not seen episode four. I have no insight into what is coming. So if I say something that turns out to be a spoiler, I'm sorry, I am trying to avoid them. But that's one of the first things that I noticed is they've aged up the characters. They're all 20, where they were a few years younger and more at that cusp of, and more at that cusp of, uh, you are now no longer a child, it's time for you to start to do adult things. Whereas in the series, they're already beyond that. Rand's still living at home, but Perrin is married and has a wife and a child on the way. And that's very different from where he was. He was the apprentice. He wasn't the blacksmith, he was the apprentice to the blacksmith, uh, who was not a young man, but not elderly or anything, like he wasn't in going to be immediately taking things over. Um, Matt's family is portrayed very differently in the, in the series versus the books, and I think that's going to be the biggest change, comparatively. Egwene is, is fairly little, not as changed as much in the book. She's a young girl who's just been told by the, by the Women's Council that she can now braid her hair, which is their symbol that this girl is now a woman and now old enough to be married and taken seriously. So that is very similar. Although in the book, it wasn't a ceremony where they push you off a cliff. <laughs> it was 
framed more as a okay so the women's council met and we've discussed Egwene and yeah we think she's she's old enough and mature enough to be considered a woman now that's not to say that this didn't happen in the books, that there wasn't a ceremony where there was a braiding and everybody clapped and, and then pushed her off a cliff and then she came back and it came back into everything else. But that definitely wasn't mentioned. It was just a woman's council decision. Yes, Egwene is old enough that she can braid her hair and consider herself a woman. I kind of like that they did that because the whole with her struggling against the water and then finally calming down and just letting the water carry her comes back later when they start talking about the one power. And we will discuss it a little more when we get further into episode two. Uh, it puts him in very different places. Matt is a prankster in the books. He's still he really comes across as the youngest of the boys, even though they are all the same age. He doesn't seem to have any major ties, where in the books, they've made his family into kind of the wastrels and lower class of, of Emmonsfield. And his mother seems to be a drunk. His father seems to be a womanizer. And his, he did have younger sisters in the books, but they weren't so much younger. They weren't old enough, like his sisters weren't old enough to braid, braid their hair. They were girls. But I got the impression from the books that they were much closer in age to Matt than what they're portrayed here. Here they are little girls. And Matt is the one looking after them, and that's not something that you get the impression of in the books at all. And I think that's going to be the biggest change from the books to the series, is that in doing that, I think they fundamentally changed Matt's character. Because in the books, he was the one who was like, yeah, sign me up. We're leaving this, this one horse town. I get to go somewhere and do something that's interesting rather than milk my, milk my dad's cows. Yes, please. I mean, Matt was very attached. Matt wanted to see the world. Matt wanted adventure and everything else. And the other boys did a little bit too, but they had responsibilities that they cared about. Rand had a father that he loved very dearly, that he was very worried about. They, they also truncated Rand's father and the injury. In the book, that was a much bigger deal because Nynaeve in the books wasn't taken. She actually looked Tam over and said, I'm sorry, I, there's nothing I can do for him. He's gonna die. I have to save my energy to help people who can be helped. And then he goes and he finds Moraine and Moraine heals him, which they did do in the series, but it wasn't, there wasn't a weight there compared to what it was in the books. In the books, this was a big deal that they not only got an Aes Sedai to to heal him when everybody else had given up on him. But that was the reason why Rand, Rand felt obligated to go with her because he healed Tam, because she healed Tam. And because of the things she said about the Trollocs after them and everything else, but even then, Of the three boys, both Perrin and, and Ran were like, okay, so we're going to go to the White Tower, we're going to find out why the Trollocs are after us, and then when we're done with all this, we're just going to go home. Whereas, in the series, it seems like Rand and, Rand and Perrin have no ties left to, like, their kids out on a lark. 
they have no ties left to Emmons Field. I mean, they're young men who can strike out on their own. Whereas uh, Matt has responsibilities. He has his little sisters that no one else in his family is looking after. No one else in his family is actually uh, keeping track of. So yeah, he wants to get home to protect his sisters. His sisters need him. So it's, it's a very flip dynamic. I'm not saying it's bad, but it's very interesting because I, I don't know how that's going to impact how the rest of his character plays out. Anyway, I have, I have many notes, many, many notes. I did like that they made more of, okay. So one thing that I did notice, in the books when they talk about the Aes Sedai's ring, and I'm pointing at my own ring as if it has anything to do with it, when they talk about the Aes Sedai's ring, the Aes Sedai are given a ring as part of as part of hitting milestones in their training, that it has become a symbol of being an Aes Sedai. In the books, you'd have had to have spent a significant period of time around Aes Sedai to know that that ring is a symbol of Aes Sedai. It is the serpent biting its own tail. In the books, there's never any mention of a stone. It is just a, it is just a gold ring of a serpent biting its own tail. So random people in a village in the middle of nowhere, and let's get real, Emmons Field and is in the two rivers, which is the middle of nowhere. It is a in a valley in mountains that is blocked off by very wide rushing rivers in the back of, of Andor. Like, there is no reason to go there. The Two Rivers is a very insular community. I mean, they, they do trade with the outside world in tobacco, which they call tobacco in this world, and, she, and uh, sheep's wool. But unless you're a trader going in there, to buy those things to take out and sell in the, in the greater world, or unless you're a peddler or a member of the traveling people, the, people, the Tuatha'an, who travel anywhere, the peddlers are there to see if they can make some money since nobody goes there. There's no reason to go there. It's not in the way to anywhere. It's difficult to get to. So they don't get a lot of people going in and out of the two rivers which is why everybody immediately stops when a strange man wanders in, a strange man that nobody knows, wanders into the uh, wine spring, all cloaked and covered, all cloaked and rain soaked and stuff like that. And everybody looks at him going, who the hell is this guy? Because nobody enters the two rivers. Everybody knows everybody. It is a backwater that is very insular. Also, one thing that I don't think that the series has done a good job of is explaining land. Lan walks into the wine spring. He's asked to name himself he does. He says his name is Lan Mandragoran, which is correct. He's not lying. Um, and then he introduces Moraine without giving her a surname or her honorific, which I understand. Uh, I said I are not necessarily well loved in the outside world. So you wouldn't necessarily, unless you're trying to overawe people, you wouldn't necessarily introduce a woman as I said I. And as we may eventually find out, her house name is kind of famous. It doesn't play a lot of role in the books, but it is something that needs to be known. And even these people in this backwater, because of something that one of her relatives did, they may recognize the name. So I kind of understand that, but it just come it came across so much as, here's Moraine. <laughs> Like, 
here's Adele or here's Madonna. It's like, okay. Um, uh, but while they do bring up that Lan is a warder and that he feels Moraine's pain when in, a, in the third episode when Nynaeve's taking care of him, they don't really talk about what a warder is. And I think that's something that people might get tripped up on. Um, I think probably eventually they will explain it, but in case you're wondering, he's not her husband. He's not her love interest. They've been traveling together and working together for 20 years. He is her warder. A warder is a warrior who is largely the Aes Sedai's bodyguard. There are circumstances in which the Aes Sedai is not going to necessarily be able to protect herself. There are places and people that she will not be able to channel, uh, channel around openly. And that's what a warder is meant to be, is, is more or less a bodyguard. When an Aes Sedai and many do take warders. Takes a warder, they bond them using the one power, and that gives them superhuman uh, stamina. It gives them a lot of things. There's a reason why uh, he's standing watch and letting everyone else sleep while he doesn't sleep. He has the stamina to go days without sleep both from his training as a Borderlands warrior, which I'm also assuming they're going to explain a little bit more later. I went into a little bit of that in my primer. The Borderlands are those lands that are right next to the Blight, so they get incursions of Shadow Spawn, like Trollux and, and Fades, or Midral, or Mithral, or however you're supposed to pronounce that on the regular. So they are trained from a very young age to be good swordsmen, or at least good warriors. But he takes it to the next level, both because of who he is, who I'm hoping that the show will go further into a little later, and because he is a warder. He has been given powers via the water bond to be more even more than human. And yes, he can feel any pain that Moraine takes, and Moraine can feel his pain. They can sort of sense they can sense each other, they can sense each other's emotions. But they're not lovers. And I know that that's probably going to be something that people assume, considering one of the first scenes we see of the two of them together talking is them in a bath. They have been traveling together for 20 years. They've been bonded that long. They are very comfortable around each other. As you can imagine, if you're traveling in the days, if you're traveling in backwards, where there's no facilities, you're going to be camping with each other. You're going to have seen each other naked. That's not really going to be an issue once you've been traveling together long enough. So the two of them being comfortable enough to bathe together is not out, is not that out there. Also, Lan's grown up in a society where communal bathing, communal co-ed bathing is a normal thing that happens on the regular. So him being absolutely okay with that. Is very much in character. She's not a borderlander. Her people are far more prudish in that regard. But again, years of traveling with this person, years of trusting this person with your life and your secrets and everything else. Uh, Lan is one of the few people who knows 
what exactly Moraine is doing and what exactly they're risking. So there's a lot of trust and a lot of love, but it's not, it's not a romantic love. They are not lovers. They care very deeply for each other. They are very close bonded, but they're not romantically involved. Okay. So now, where do I go from here? Okay, mountainside. Egwene and Rand. Yes, in the books, they were very, very close. They were considered all but betrothed from a very young age. Um, they were not seen to have a physical relationship in the books, but that was, that particular area is considered to be relatively prudish. Compared to 2021, so I'm not really surprised that they made that a little more explicit in the series. If that was something that was considered kind of okay in their area, they, they probably would have been. Um, but the feelings between Rand and Egwene that they're kind of growing apart as Egwene is deciding to go and become a wisdom, that was never explicit that she was going to become The Wisdom's Apprentice, it was something that was mentioned that might happen, but then all of the events that happened in the book. The fact that they had a thing and are kind of growing apart due to circumstances, that is very much, they still very much care for each other, but they are definitely going down different paths. And they aren't always terribly okay with it. That was in the books. That's not really all that different. Perrin is much changed. Perrin was always relatively a serious young man. Giving him a wife and child on the way and then ripping that away from him at his own hands, even if it, it was absolutely an accident. That was absolutely an accident. He did not mean to do that. him carrying that guilt is not really out of character for him. He was always kind of a brooding, quiet, serious young man. So that's, it seems a little mean to do that to him, but it doesn't fundamentally change his character. His character has always been more serious, more brooding, that kind of thing. So I'm not upset. I'm kind of upset that they did that because that's a really horrible thing to do to your characters. And like I torture my characters on a regular basis when I'm writing. So that that's a pretty nasty thing to put somebody through. But I think the reason that they did that and had Nynaeve taken was basically to separate to give all of the characters a more immediate to make the danger more immediate to all of them and to basically stop any kind of argument as to whether or not they should leave they've seen what devastation that these trolls can bring they've seen the horrible things that can happen do you want these trolls to come back and hurt the family that you have left? Tam nearly died. Rand's father nearly died. The girls went missing. Who knows what could have happened if they hadn't hidden where they were. Um, Perrin's wife and, and unborn child died. Nynaeve got dragged off. She's presumed dead. 
your life isn't going to be what you thought. I think that was largely changed to make it more realistic that these characters, without any kind of argument, without any kind of preamble, just follow Maureen when she says, they're going to come back if you don't follow me. Because the idea of them coming back and wreaking even more pain and suffering on the people that they care about is just so unthinkable that they're going to follow this woman that they don't know because she might be right. And there was some of that in the books, but they've kind of turned the knob all the way to 11 on that one. They, they've really cranked that, that angst up in order to expedite that process. Because in the books, there was a lot more, no, we can't leave, nobody leaves the two rivers, blah, 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 blah. Rather than have that, they just made it that much more awful so that when the characters saddle up and ride out, as soon as she says, you need to go, it makes sense to the audience. Um, Yeah, we've gone over most of this. I made way too many notes in the first episode. I basically just wrote down everything that happened. <laughs> um, so yeah, the whole thing with Marin Alvare, the, uh, the innkeeper's wife, naming Maureen A. Sedai from having seen her ring is a little out there from the books. I think that's largely from expedience. In the books, yes, some people could recognize an A. Sedai from her ring. But unless you'd had a reason to be around a lot of A. Sedai, and most people haven't, you wouldn't know that. That wasn't, that wasn't common knowledge that everybody knew. It's not out there. It's not completely uncommon, but it's not common. Um, they also changed Nynaeve a bit. She has a lot more knowledge about the White Tower and than she did in the books. The idea that her mentor went to the White Tower and was turned away due to classism is not consistent with the White Tower in the books, which makes me think there's more going on there than, she's, than she knows or is letting on. But it does deepen the whole issue that Nynaeve has with the White Tower and the Aes Sedai as part of her character in the rest of the books. Because in the books, it, it comes across at times as, as almost irrational how much she doesn't like the Aes Sedai. So I think that might be the reason why they decided to change that, was to give her more of a reason to not like Aes Sedai and to have this deep-seated distrust of them right from, di right from minute one. If she's been taught her whole life that the Aes Sedai are classist assholes who won't help you just because who will turn you away because you don't conform with their idea of who should be trained, then yeah, I, I, that it makes a lot more sense why she doesn't like them. I have drills her flipped upside down. That's cute. Um, It also raises some other questions. They also make it so that she's not from the Two Rivers initially, which is different because I'm not sure where they're going with that one. I have some thoughts about that one, but I have a feeling they may be spoilers, so I'm, I'm gonna keep them to myself.
Okay. That goes to me. But yeah, I think we've touched on everything from the first episode. One thing I did notice, um, as I said, there's no gems. in the rings in the books. And I mean, Robert Jordan described everything in excruciating detail in the books. So if there were gems in the, in the rings in the books, we would have known about them. I'm not upset that they decided to do that. It does make the ring a lot more obvious, which I understand. But one thing I did notice that was interesting was they've color coded The rings with the uh, with the stone of the Aja. Moraine's is blue. She's blue Aja. The sisters you see in the very beginning, who are tracking down men who can channel, are red sisters, which they've helpfully color coded their their uh, attire as all of them wearing bright sparkling red, in case you needed to be aware that they were red sisters. And the gems in there is a red and the yellow sister that Am and Valda cut her hands off. Oh my god. Has a, has a ring with a yellow stone. And I'm not going to go too much into it unless you guys want me to. Uh, down in the comments if you want me to talk about the Aes Sedai and their Ajas and what they mean. Um, But the whole conversation that Amon Valda, the really nasty white cloak, really nasty child of the light who has this Aes Sedai burning at the stake. And yes, they did do that when they could to Aes Sedai. The children of the light are assholes. But they believe anyone who touches the white tower uh, the White Tower. Anyone who touches the One Power is a dark friend. That is not a common belief. There are some who believe it. Uh, but the children are definitely a problem with regards to that belief. Um, becomes interesting because the sister that he has chained up, he has tied up and is effectively executing is... A sister of the yellow Aja. He's talking about mercy. Uh, he's talking about pain and mercy and everything else. The yellow Aja, their thing is healing. They are the sisters who take the most pride in their ability to heal others. And he's burning this woman at the stake and talking about how sometimes brutality is necessary. It's like, no, these women dedicate themselves to healing. You're a monster. <laughs> oh, yeah, he is a monster. Amon Valda is a piece of work. Like, a lot of the Children of the Light don't get a lot of sympathy. They're not nice people, but yeah, some of them are worse than others, and he's definitely in one of them. In the second episode, we get uh, an image of the tapestry, and we see uh, a bunch of. It's the we see the opening for the first time, and it's we're seeing a loom where they're weaving. It's supposed to be imagery of them weaving the age lace. The wheel of time is actually the wheel of is. Spinning, it's supposed to be a spinning wheel. It's also been likened to a loom. And the wheel is turning and weaving this uh, age lace, this tapestry of everyone's lives woven together. So that's what that's supposed to be. But what it's actually weaving, the image that you're seeing, is seven Aes Sedai, one of each Aja. Again, if you want me to talk more about the Ajas, comment below. I'll do that in a future video. Um, it's very interesting. 
ferryman drowning that happened in the books actually the ferryman didn't drown in the books but I, again I think they wanted to make Maureen seem more dangerous than she was by having her actually accidentally kill somebody in the books everybody the uh, Emmons healers were suspicious of Maureen because of the fact that they knew that she channeled and sunk the ferry but nobody died there but I think they again wanted to dial the angst up to 11 by you let that man die what what are you gonna do to us if we no longer we no longer do that there was that in the books but again I think they're just dialing that up to 11 there um, You also see Moraine uh, channeling to help the channeling at the um, words are hard guys sorry at the horses what she's doing is she's washing away their their fatigue in case they need to need to ride off again in a hurry and Lan's giving her crap about it because she can't do that to herself just like she can't heal herself and she's injured and she's waste and as far as he's concerned she's overtaxing herself in the book she wasn't injured there was just so much going on that she was using up a lot of her own energy to keep everybody moving keep everybody safe in the book she wasn't injured so we didn't have that ticking clock Um, then we have the gemstone scene between uh, Moraine and Egwene, where Moraine reveals to Egwene that listening to the wind is just a colloquialism that her village uses to explain the fact that she can channel and that she is one of these rare women who will channel whether she wants to or not. The spark in her will manifest whether she wants to or not. And if she learns to become a nice guy, she can control it. Whereas she learns only what her village, what well, they don't go into too much is if she learns only what, it, what Nynaeve can teach her, she'll be able to do a few things, but she won't really have control over the power. Um, I said I channel openly. They learn how to channel. What a village wisdom can teach her would be very rudimentary. They don't really think of it as channeling. They just think of it as a talent that other people don't get. Um, although Nynaeve knows more about the towers, I don't know how much she understands about her own ability. We'll see. Um, but the gemstone goes back to her initiation as a woman when she gets thrown in the river. At first, when she's in the river, she's struggling. She's struggling to get to the surface, and it isn't until she calms down and just lets herself float that she comes up to the surface and is able to breathe and calm down and let the, and let the river take her and wash herself up onto shore. And that's very much how channeling Sidar is described in the books. Um, if you try and fight the river that is Sidar, you will not be able to control it. The only way to control it is to surrender to it, to let it fill you, and then you can, to let it fill you, to let it take over yourself, and then you can wield it. So the fact that Moraine is talking about her being in a river, let it fill you, let it take you, calm your mind. There is nothing but you in the river. So in that way, being a channeler of Sidar is likened to her initiation as a woman. So I do like that. That, that worked out very, very well. And it plays out very similar to the way it does in the books. 
I love the uh, the line. You don't listen to the wind, Egwene. The wind listens to you. I don't think that was in the book. I think that's that that was written for the show, and I like it. I like it a lot. It really awakens her idea of you are very special. This is something that you never considered. Yeah, I, I do like that. The way they did that, that worked out really well. Perrin and the wolves. The wolves and Perrin have a bond. They haven't gone into it much yet. The wolves like Perrin. We will see more of that. Randy's kind of an ass in this version. Rand had his moments of being an ass in the books, let's not be wrong. Um, Rand is one of the few people who actually stands up to Moraine. Everybody else kind of tiptoes around her because as Matt says, the lady sh shoots fireballs, so let's not get on her bad side. But he just seems like so much more of an ass in this show. This woman has taken you on and is protecting you and you just yell at her and accuse her of all of these things. And I don't know, he comes across as far more of a petulant asshole in this, in this version. Okay. Shutter logo. They did explain it. I like how they explained it in the series. It has a role to play and it's going to continue having a role to play going forward. But the idea that this is a different evil than the evil of the Trollocs and the Nidral to the point where the, the, the Shadow Spawn are afraid of it was well handled. It was very differently done in the books, but I think they did a good job of it in this without it taking up too much time. Another neat thing in episode two was there's a lot of sweeping crane, sweeping probably drone or crane shots that you see of landscape. And we talked about in my video on a primer that the world had been broken, that there were uh, mountains, mountain ranges that were worn down, uh, seas that dried up. And there's one shot where you can see that there's very clearly this enormous bridge that's clearly been built to cross something, but there's no water or anything for it to be crossing there anymore. The bridge is broken down. It's clearly been there a while, but I think that I liked how they did that because that really, uh, like the statues and stuff from, from Middle Earth that you saw in, in the Lord of the Rings, it gives this world a history and you see this enormous bridge going to nowhere and it gives you an idea that this world has a history that we don't know anything about. I'm kind of glad that they did that. I hope they continue to do that. That was something that you saw a lot in the books was structures that made no sense for where they are anymore. Nynaeve was dragged away. It's episode three, we find Nynaeve is back. Uh, she had been dragged away by the Trolloc. We got to see what happened with her. That she managed to kill a Trolloc one-on-one -on -one is badass. And landing her of a fight and he actually knocks her out. I'm like, wow. Wow, okay. Um, that's going to come back because these two characters are going to continue to interact and 
they laid hands on one another. That's that that's interesting. Okay. Um, Egwene lighting the fire. In the books, I don't think she did. I think Perrin did eventually light the fire himself. Because Egwene really didn't have any control over the power, so her being able to light the fire, she did try, but I don't think she succeeded in the books. So the fact that she's got that much, much control already is a little surprising. Um, Nynaeve using herbs and stuff to try and do what she can to slow the poison and help Moraine. That's very in keeping with what a wisdom is. Most wisdoms in the Two Rivers are not channelers. They're just people who are good with healing and they're good with everything else. Nynaeve is, is a channeler. But if you haven't been trained by somebody who knows what they're doing, channeling doesn't come easy. So she is she isn't channeling here. She's just using her knowledge of wounds and poisons and stuff to try and help Nine to help Moraine. I'm sure they will go into more of that once Moraine is available to chat with her because she's going to have words. The dreams are relatively consistent with what they were in the book. I'm not going to go too much into them because they are very much spoilers. But the idea that Perrin would have a dream of a wolf eating his former wife, eating his dead wife, again seems really knife twisty and I'm not sure why they would go that far other than for shock value and I'm not really a fan of that. It's, it, it seems out of character for what the wolves represented to Perrin in the books, so I, I, I don't know why they would do that. Maybe there's a reason. Maybe we'll find out. And they get to this mining town, which they did name, but it's not a name I recognize from the books. And I didn't write down what the name was. I was watching this at like one o'clock in the morning last night. I did watch it last Friday when it came out, but the Dana character, the, the woman who takes the boys in is not one that's from the books, but what happens there is relatively similar to what happens to Matt and Perrin, or sorry, Matt and Rand going forward. They did do odd jobs for their supper. They did go into villages and try and help themselves and they did get set upon by dark friends who knew who they were and were, were preying on them because of who they were. So while this character and this particular mining town did not appear, it is consistent with what happened in the books. And we get to meet Tom. In the books we meet Tom in Evans Field and he follows them out. So this is very different from how the books went. But Tom still tries to help the boys, even if he starts out by being an asshole and stealing money from Matt. Poor Matt. He is such a butt monkey in this. I mean he kind of is in the books, but not to this degree. You don't you don't get quite the same class differentiation between Matt and the other boys as in the books as you do in this. And I feel bad for the poor kid. But if that's what it takes to make them get what they need from that. And then we have Nynaeve, Lan, and Moraine meeting 
up with the other eyes today. That did not happen in the books. It's not that surprising because there definitely was a group of Aes Sedai who had captured Logan Ablar, who had been claiming to be the Dragon Reborn and were taking him in roughly the same direction. So the fact that they gave her a wound that needed an Aes Sedai healing, it's not that out there to have rerouted that particular, to have them run across this group of Aes Sedai. And Leandrin being the leader, she's a red, that makes sense. I will tell you that reds, their purpose, their Aja focuses on tracking down men who can channel and gentling them, which we saw in the opening scene of the show that they were all red sisters is not surprising. That's what the Reds are there for. And the Reds are among the Aes Sedai who do not take orders. That's why you don't really see any orders. The other Ajas all do. There is an Aja that frequently takes more than one order, but most just take one. Leandrin is an interesting character that will continue to be relevant throughout the series because she was relevant throughout the books, but to go into more of who Leandrin is other than the fact that she is a red who is well respected would be spoilers, so I'm not going to go there. I think I recognized a couple of the other eyes that I there as well, but I'm not 100% sure that I, I am correct in my assumptions, so I'm going to leave that out for now. Uh, what else? Tom being willing to take these boys under his wing. He has his reasons, I guess. His reasons in the books were different because when he met up with them, he was trying to be a buffer between them and the Aes Sedai against Moraine, which he doesn't know that they have anything to do with Aes Sedai at this point. But he does know that dark friends are after them, so any man who walks in the light, I suppose, would want to help people who are running from dark friends. He is a Gleeman, which is a traveling bard. That is not new. The fact that he's using a guitar in this is different. In the books, he used either a harp or a flute. But they gave him more of a rock vibe here, sort of a folksy rock vibe. So switching it to a guitar, I guess, makes a little more sense. The Aiel in the cage. I'm a little surprised they're bringing the Aiel in already. But again, expediency. The, you rarely see that hair color outside of the outside of the waist when it's roughly the same color as Rand's hair is is relevant. But to go further into it is a bit of a spoiler, so I'm not going to go there. Um, I don't think there's anything else that happened there. Oh! Karen and Egwene not knowing who the traveling people is. That's that's new. The traveling people did go into the two rivers. They go everywhere. They literally travel everywhere. I wonder how much we're going to get into who the traveling people are. But they are 
kind of coded Romani, but they follow a very specific code called the Way of the Leaf. They are absolute pacifists. They do not believe in any form of violence, not even violence of self-defense. In the books, Egwene and Perrin did run into this group of, of traveling people. It went a little different, but it's still very consistent with the books. The fact that they didn't know who they are is inconsistent. Not knowing their ways is consistent because a lot of people don't trust the traveling people. So young people from the villages wouldn't necessarily have been allowed near the traveling people. So them not knowing the introduction, the traditional introduction and much about what they actually are is consistent. But they would definitely know who the traveling people are being from the two rivers. Everybody knows who the traveling people are, even if they know a lot of horrible rumors about kidnapping children and stuff like that. But the audience needs to be told who the traveling people are, so I think that's why in this version Egwene and Perrin don't know who the traveling people are. To make them sort of audience surrogates. I think the last thing I needed to talk about was the Minetherin story. The kids in the books didn't know the name of Minetherin at all, so them having songs about Minetherin didn't make a lot of sense. But them having a song that they liked the sound of, but didn't understand the meaning of it, is completely consistent with the books. Moraine telling them the story of Minetherin. In the books, she did that because the villagers were going to run her out of were going to try and run her out of Emmons Field and so she wows them with this story to shut them up even though she risked her life to try and save them but they didn't have that kind of time to spend in Emmons Field so they moved it to this spot. It was a lot of time to spend on that story when it doesn't, it's interesting, but it doesn't have a lot to do with what happens. I'm surprised they did it that early on. But maybe they had to do that in order to then contrast it to Shatter Logo to make the evil that much more plain. Maybe that's why. I don't know. But I think that's all the information I have. That's all my thoughts on the first three episodes of The Wheel of Time. I think the adaptation is interesting. It's definitely a departure from the books in a lot of ways, but it is still following them in a lot of ways too. And I am not somebody who gets too hung up on how they're changing from the books and is going to be all nerd ragey about it. So we'll have to see how they use these changes to tell the story they want to tell and how that's going to work for them. So thank you for joining me. Like, share, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Keep it spooky, guys. Bye.